So our third speaker for the day is Abhishek Ayadri. He is the VP of Products at Payu India. So he heads products at Payu for the SMB space, especially focusing on Payu Money, Payu Now suite of products. He has 15 years of experience and has added credibility with his go-getter work attitude at PayPal, Ajio.com, Citrus Payments earlier and now Payu. He loves solving products for Indian consumers and merchants and likes to engage and partner with startups in building products. Abhishek is all set to help you upgrade your business management skill with the most epic topic, customer retention, next time, every time. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I've got some members from my team as well, uh, from Payu. Uh, yeah, um, Anand, Tom, and Sakshi. Uh, if you have any payment page related queries and stuff like that, we can talk to them. Topic of discussion for me is again about customer retention. I'm going to take a product centric point of view, uh, especially from Payus, when what we do. Um, so, we, I mean, as compared to what Saurabh does and what Isha was speaking about, um, the offline versus the, uh, the, re uh, the real estate sector. Uh, Payu is a platform, right? I mean, we get our customer is slightly different. It's a merchant who wants a payment gateway capability. Um, so, we have two brands under our portfolio, Pay You Money and uh, Pay You Now. Pretty much uh, the way we make our money is through transaction fee for every 100 rupee transaction that goes to our platform. We make 2%, 2%, is 2 rupees. Uh, that 2 rupees is split among various people in the value chain from acquirers to banks to, um, you know, to the issuing bank and Visa and MasterCard and all of them. Uh, so finally we are left with some decent amount of money. So that's how we make money. So pay you money as a brand is focused towards startups. Uh, we provide a payment gateway uh, for them where they can, if let's say they have a website, they want to integrate or an app, they want to integrate their website or a star with SDK, uh, they go to pay you money. Uh, pay you now is a very new brand we launched, we launched it sometime last year. Uh, it's for somebody who basically a home entrepreneur and he wants to collect payments very seamlessly. Um, he just sends a link and he collects payments. Uh, so that's the two segment we deal with. Uh, there's of course a different brand called Payu Biz, which is an enterprise brand which deals with large airlines, Flipkart, Amazons. Their requirement is very different from what a startup needs. So that's how we have positioned our thing. A uh, lot of what I'm going to speak is also about, I mean, it's going to be similar to what some of the other speakers have spoken and are going to speak as well. But nevertheless, I think it's good to stress some of these points. Um, so fundamentally, uh, the two, two, two main ways to grow a business, right? And one is about uh, you know getting more and more uh, customers on your platform, and the second is retaining them. I'm not going to touch about uh, touch around the uh, operational efficiency bit, which because it pretty much impacts the bottom line and not the top line. Um, so among these two, obviously, which is more important, right? I mean, uh, it is going to be retention, and that is the focus of my team and. We day in and day out, that's one of the biggest problems that we really look at. Um, how do you impact retention? How do you impact retention? And uh, yeah, to, to give you an uh, analogy about it, think of um, a bucket. Uh, if you want to fill it with water, uh, you have a tap running. And uh, let's say the bucket has holes in it. Um, so even though there's a lot of water in flow, uh, still there will be a lot of leakage, right? So you're not going to, the bucket is never going to be full. Uh, so you, if, your retention is very, pretty much similar in layman's terms. Um, you're going to have various marketing, uh, through marketing you're going to acquire more and more customers, but eventually you're never going to derive more value. Uh, you're going to leak dollars because spending your product is not right stage to be scaled up and stuff like that. So retention becomes a very important uh, uh, topic that every team should focus on. And the second important factor is uh, what are startups up against? I mean, uh, fundamentally, the multi the competition is quite severe. Uh, you have customer who is ever demanding. He's very uh, he wants the best of service, whether it is offline or online. And how do we do that? Uh, it becomes much more tricky in a uh, in a in an online world, right? I mean, because the, the touch points are very low. Um, so how do we engage with them and treat them in a way that you know, and to try and mimic the offline world? So that's the challenge we deal with on a day-to-day day -day basis. Uh, so how do we build 
our product so that we make sure that we personalize our experience and they, and we make them feel that we are they are for them whether they are coming through the, you know either coming to a Facebook channel or you know Twitter or call of callers or to email right and how do we personalize their uh, issues so that we can handle them better through their journeys um, and what are the impact uh, the impact of retention is um, it leads to of course brand loyalty and eventually leads to customer loyalty as Isha and uh, Saurabh mentioned we are speaking about. Um, the other important aspect is it, 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 if you focus on retention eventually it, it, I mean, in, a, in a good way you have products and you understand which cohort of users um, would use that particular product you would, you would uh, reach uh, more affordable uh, cost of acquisition channels for your merchant right? and uh, for your customer. Um, and that will help you lower down some of your marketing spends. And uh, I think Saurabh was mentioning this, uh, about 20% of your users pretty much contribute to your 80% uh, of your revenue and obviously <coughs> any existing merchant would uh, or customer would actually contribute I mean 33% on an average more as compared to say, any new customer that is coming. So now having set this baseline in place, now how do we actually go about uh, um, you know, retaining uh, merchants or customers. In our world, uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, there, there are so many, the competition is quite high, right? And Payu has, though we are one of the largest players, we have a razor pay, we have builders, we have an Insta Mojo. How do you make sure that, uh, you know, they choose us as compared to somebody else? So, and what are some of the levers that as we as product teams have uh, to work with these players and make sure that they have a very good um, experience with our product. So that's the problem we work with. Um, to give you a small, I mean, example, let's say uh, every month, I mean, uh, how do you go about building this? Let's say you have a, um, a, a small product. Um, you are, you think that you have, uh, it's, it's something that you can launch out in the market. You have a, a small marketing strategy around it. And uh, let's say on week one, you have about 100, 100 uh, customers coming over to experience your product. And uh, over a period of time, let's say at week 24, um, if you start tracking how, how many much, how many customers are left in your funnel, the curve would pretty much look like that. Uh, it will, it will it'll have a sharp down, I mean, uh, drop off initially, and then it will start flattening out as you go, depending on the cohort of users that you are targeting. Um, so the point where the cohort starts flattening itself, that's where uh, you know you have probably found some kind of a product market fit. Uh, that's the core set of users that you need to engage with, speak to them and understand uh, how and what are their needs, what do they like about your product, <coughs> what do they don't like, uh, if they want to continue using the product, what are things that you would need to build over a period of time. And uh, if the percentage, let's say uh, initially when they start out, it's a low 10 percentile or 20 percent range and your, your aim as a product, uh, an organization should be to increase that percentage about 40 40 percent and that's the time you you can truly say that you have achieved product market fit and your product actually is ready to scale um, so that's one of the biggest learning that we had uh, when we started out uh, pay you now as a product so pay you now is a um, is a very new product line i mean it targets small entrepreneurs who make uh, let's say i mean they are freelancers who would like to collect uh, online payments or maybe uh, startups who you know are small home entrepreneurs who make maybe cupcakes and they would like to list it online and start collecting payments. So how do you go about engaging with them, making sure that they understand um, what is the value proposition for them. And the first, one of the biggest challenges we had was, you know, they never understood why, let's say they are getting paid, uh, you know, 100 rupees. They never knew why is 98 rupees getting settled, settled into their account, right? Um, you know, it took us a, because they were used to the wallet world where you know, most people, let's say, want to transfer money, you you, you transfer by 100 rupees. And when we used to charge them 2 rupees, they were like, why do I need to, you know, charge, pay the extra 2 rupees charge? So they never understood that the difference between a wallet and a, and a, and a payment gateway is we need to play, I mean, pay people along the value chain as well. And wallet, pretty much, there's a limitation around wallet uh, in terms of how much you can transfer and all of that. So there was a lot of education that we had to do with the user to make them understand why wallet is not sustainable for you as a as a, as a merchant I mean as a merchant category and uh, how we are going to handle it. So we had to actually uh, 
uh, not just educate but also make sure that we spend a lot of effort towards uh, clarifying what is going to be the settlement, how the entire journey would look like and stuff like that. So that was a big aha moment for us. We we never thought that at least when we are launching the product that that would be one of the challenges. We assumed to an extent that these, I mean, everybody would be, you know, would be okay to pay the two percent because in an enterprise world or someone started to understand that, you know, you have to pay people along the value chain as well. So that was one big learning. Uh, so once you understand which is your target group, um, you you should start asking questions as to where do these uh, customers shop, uh, how do you target them better. So that would help you bring, I mean, reduce your cost of acquisition as well. And what really happens? Uh, if you scale without, without you know, a product market fit, obviously you're going to shell a lot of dollars, um, you have, you'll have a high burn rate and that's not sustainable for your product, right? Um, now, what is the point? I think sort of touched it briefly. Uh, very, uh, I think we take 40%, we are seeing 40% as a number which is good enough for to understand which is the, the, to achieve product market fit, then we are take it to the next level to figure out how do you slowly scale your marketing um, channels, right? You figure out where do these, who are your target group? Are they freelancers or they uh, home shoppers or they <coughs> transport? Which is the industry which is using your product? You define that core set that you would, that is trying to, I mean, that is experiencing your product and they are liking your product. And then you at least know who are those people you need to, you need to start making videos and education, educational material and stuff like that, which is targeting towards that particular category of companies. And then once you do that, you are ready to scale. You can go all out for a you know a market and get those users into your funnel. Um, moving on, some of the levers that every product team has to uh, retain. I mean, these are some of the I mean large buckets that we have: uh, be it product improvement, the onboarding, uh, notification. I'm going to touch upon I mean touch upon them as we go through each slide. Um, some of them are low hanging fruits, and some of them are really difficult to execute. Um, but let's talk about them in the upcoming slides. Product improvement, right? I think this is one of the, the lowest hanging fruit. You already have a product that is built out and it's it's working in the in the market in some way. How do you make sure that you make small tweaks to it uh, for incremental revenue, right? For example, if you take a Swiggy, uh, Swiggy, let's say initially when they started out, they had very few uh, merchants for restaurants on their platform. Um, all I mean, once they found out that the core group of users already using their uh, platform. All they need, needed to do was maybe uh, add the uh, more number of uh, restaurants onto the um, uh, ecosystem, right? Or maybe introduce they. I mean, after speaking to the users, you experience that uh, you know the users are, the, those set of cohort of customers actually like some other cuisines as well. How do you get more and more restaurants which cater to the needs of that particular cohort is already using your product? So that becomes a key so that you gain uh, more value with. Very little uh, tech effort, for instance. So on your platform, how do you see the improvement or improvement suggestions? Uh, do you like it? Do you yeah, so get your feedbacks that they correct. Uh, yeah, so the two ways, or I mean honestly, what we do is once we launch a product, we we talk to users. We uh, I mean there are two funnels. I mean if you look at the funnel, there will be people who have not used your product and the people who have used your product. For people who have used it, started using your product, we start we have one-on-one -on -one discussions with them and uh, talk to them as to, I mean, let them speak in terms of what do they like about the product, what do they not like, if we need to move to the next level, what are the, some of the features that they would like. And over a period of, over a period of time, you figure out that, uh, you know, people start, when you let them talk, they will give you honest feedback, and that is the best way to go about it. Um, for some of the other products, we also send out service. Service doesn't really, uh, at least because of scale and the number of people, I mean, not many people really, I mean, answer, I mean, a survey, right? So, you have not seen much conversion out there. Um, whereas, talking to them, at least uh, for if your product is very new and a uh, lot of users are liking it, definitely one of them conversation help. So, you sample the. Yeah, we do a sampling and understand who is sampling. Yeah, so, this is also a product improvement. Now, your product pay you money. Yeah. Close that down. What was the reason? Because no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, so there's a misconception. So pay you money when it started out, right? It was a wallet. Right. Uh, so we, we shut down the wallet business fundamentally. But pay you money also had the other side, which is the payment gateway. <coughs> so any if you have a website, you want to collect a, a payment, you need a, yeah. a payment gateway. Right? So that's what pay you money does. So the wallet aspect was the only only thing because we had to add. I mean, so just, 
the central government. So central also had a wallet license where you had a wallet license we had to shut down one. RBI guidelines otherwise you have only one license. Yes. So I come from analytics background, so I mean, pardon me for because I'm asking this question, but uh, do you then, uh, when you find, find the samples, do you really look at how often these people are using the, or maybe back to your cohort analysis thing, like how often these people are using the platform to yes. such target? Yes. Uh, so product improvement and making small tweaks is the lowest hanging fruit, and I mean, I would say that, that, that should be the first thing that you should target. I mean, among all those, I think there are six buckets. Uh, it really depends on what kind of firm you are, which which you think is more important for. But product improvements is something that, uh, because the tech effort is low, uh, that's something that you should take up initially. Um, the onboarding, it though it largely impacts acquisition as a channel, so that more number of people actually convert onto your platform. Uh, we have done a lot of work in pay you money. Uh, I mean, consider us, right? I mean, we are a, we are a payments platform. We have there's a lot of regulations around. You know what kind of merchant should enter? What what kind of documentation and legal and statutory uh, document that you collect from them? So it becomes critical for us to make sure that we are in line with RBI guidelines. Otherwise, we'll get shut down. Right? But from a merchant's perspective, we need to allow him to experience the product because unless he experiences your product, he's not going to sign up. He's not going to give you all your documents. So as compared to giving, you know, asking all the fields or you know all the mandatory, making all the fields mandatory and asking all the doc documentation upfront. We decide. We decide to distribute it. We allow. We. We. I think we make him on. Uh, we just ask for four fields and make them go live. Uh, we give them a payment. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the kit so that they can start integrating their uh, website to a payment gateway like ours. And then post for post facto, we slowly ask for documentation. If let's say they do an international transaction, uh, they would like to. Uh, they have to submit some additional documents. If they have to. Uh, uh, let's say you know uh, we we put this uh, settlement on hold. The money is with us unless they complete all some of the other documentation because our we have mandates us that we, they need to give us certain document. So we've broken down the onboarding journey so that the experience is much more seamless for a merchant and they get to experience the product. And you, I think every I mean if you look at some of the startups, most people think that onboarding is uh, you know ask all the information up front. I think that their small tweaks can be made so that uh, the journey is much more seamless. Uh, also, because I think re-engaging users, I think Sarah was talking about this. Re-engaging re is much more difficult than uh, you know acquiring a new client. So, yeah. moving on, notifications. I think uh, one of the very uh, we are just scraping. Most companies in India are probably scraping the surface in terms of uh, how to uh, using up uh, notifications as a platform. Uh, on a very high level, if you if you send more notifications, you're going to have uh, you know, it's going to be counted if more people are going to uh, delete your app. Uh, but some of the basics could be around if you send uh, more and more transactional based uh, notifications which are mandatory for and a customer would like it, you need to do that. But post that, you need to look, do a lot of A-B testing around what messages are uh, users really finding it more useful as compared to not. I mean, you need to make a very conscious choice around that. So, I mean, thirdly, I think you need to, I mean, uh, you need to bring about value through uh, insights, right? For example, we, um, as PayU, uh, for, for us, the, the core user is a merchant. And for a merchant, it is very, let's say we give them an insight around how many new customers are coming, uh, are transacted on a particular day, uh, what have been the, uh, you know, the, the revenue for him after, for a, for a period of time, and if, if there are peaks around that, if those kind of insights are being given, the merchant would find value around that. And uh, similarly for merchant as well, uh, advising him more or I mean, giving him notifications to bring him back to the platform. Uh, we try to do a lot of experimentation on that so that uh, uh, we uh, this is this acts as a powerful tool to uh, impact retention. <coughs> new products, uh, I mean, new products are very difficult. Uh, uh, change it, obviously because the, the the cost involved to develop a new product and the entire life cycle it goes back to the original one you 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 do the MVP you make sure that uh, you launch it out with some basic uh, assumptions you do your research so the time period is much longer and obviously it's going to have a larger impact in terms of either acquiring opening up new channels uh, for customers for you and increasing your top line. 
but and uh, the way we look about that is because payments is pretty much a, a transactional based information, you know, a, a, a startup. Uh, what we are trying to do is getting into uh, providing more and more value added services. Uh, I think just as what our broker is doing, we try to provide uh, credit for merchants, working capital loan, or be marketing as a service. For example, a lot of startups um, do not know how to do online marketing or SEO. Uh, we try to partner with them and we, you know, we have partnered with Google as well to uh, understand the needs of these merchants and tweak their SEO strategy. Um, we have also seen a lot of interest with uh, new players uh, asking for delivery as a service. Um, we are trying to do a lot of, you know, do more research around whether it really uh, does it make business sense. But these value added services is what we believe uh, will make the merchant who is our customer to be, to be sticky to a platform. And that you need to figure out what those uh, the sticky aspects are, especially in a commodity business like ours. Um, you, know, you need to do that. Uh, unless you do that, I, in, in my view, I think uh, um, he would not be willing to pay that extra two percent. Especially thinking about a startup, right? I mean, because it's not even cash positive, uh, he's making losses. He would not want to give away the two percent. Uh, so you need to give him more value, and so that he doesn't feel that the two percent is really a large amount. Uh, what about this your new product, which is Lazy Pay, which is very successful? How is it different from you know what traditional? I mean, getting an EMI. What is the differentiation? Why is it so successful? Yeah. So Lazy Pay, the I mean, Lazy Pay is a zero click checkout. Um, let's say you you want to buy your, you you want to order your Swiggy uh, food, and then you just say pay by Lazy Pay, and that is it. You don't have to do anything else. Your payment is done. Whereas an EMI, you actually get to select how many installments. And then you attach a card and all that, right? You need to do that. So Lazy Pay basically for only the first time asks you some basic details in terms of I think your phone number and your email ID, and then you're done. In the second, in the in forthcoming transaction, you're not asked any of these details. I mean, if you need to pay with uh, Lazy Pay for your red bus or any, or any other platform, all you need to do is select pay. It's a, it's a pay. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, pay by credit. Uh, sorry. Pay by credit. Yeah. Yeah. Pay back. So it is. It's zero click. Now, in my view, uh, they got multiple use cases coming for that. I think we have launched a personal loan as well for that. Uh, but it is very different from an EMI product. Customer service, I think, uh, uh, I think Isha mentioned a lot of points around customer service. In an online world, how do you do that, right? I mean, the challenge is the merchant can, if let's say he's paying, he would start throwing his issues from either one of the social channels or, or your email or your. Uh, or any, anyway, we have, you know, merchants directly mailing, mailing our CEO saying, look, you know, your customer service sucks. So how do you make sure it becomes very contextual so that whether he reaches, uh, I mean, through, uh, he reaches us through either through our social media networks or through email, how do you make sure that we know who is, what is the issue and uh, we track it in a consolidated level? So that's, and try to address it in a, in a time-bound manner. I think that's what uh, we are, we are aiming to do and get there. Um, of course, it, it's a lot of people plus uh, technology aspects as well. It, technology alone can't really solve uh, customer issues. Uh, think of American Express, think of Tata. When they really stand for, you know, why you go and book with the Spanish? Because you really think they have set the benchmark uh, for customer service. Similarly, Southwest as well. We all read in many case studies, Southwest is one of the best airlines in terms of customer service. Right? So, they all set a a golden uh, benchmark for us. We are all trying to get up there. But if you try in some way to ensure merchants don't really have negative experiences, I think that goes a long way to keep them on the platform. Uh, loyalty programs, uh, I think it been, I mean, I think uh, Saurabh was talking about it, but fundamentally uh, it can, it's a double-edged sword. You need to make sure to, it can act as a mode for you, but you need to make sure that uh, uh, you don't Allow gaming of, I mean, gaming of the system. Uh, how do you do that? It's a profit driver for us. I think, uh, especially if they are for, you know, for us from PayU perspective, we have a lot of resellers who develop uh, third party, uh, who are developers who, who recommend merchants. How do we incentivize them to get onto our platform and not go and sell uh, the payment gateway for somebody else? How do you, what kind of incentive would they want? So that's how we are currently using loyalty programs. But fundamentally, it can act as a, as a good way to. You know, get more and more users on your platform. How is the so just just uh, 
prior to that, the referral programs like clients who are now like, do you think that it's kind of successful? They say you refer your customer and you deal 20 for 250 bucks or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Is that? So, I mean, I mean, if you ask me at a very broad level, I think uh, PayU has never really uh, believed too much into uh, cashbacks, what a Paytm or anybody has done. Uh, fundamentally, because at some point, uh, you know, it, cashbacks, I mean, the cashbacks of the customer will go to some, some other platform. So, we have never done. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why I think PayU uh, moved out of the wallet business, before, uh, I mean, because we couldn't afford to buy one cash as much as a Paytm does. Or even phone pay, for instance, phone pay is doing a lot of power, even the Google Jays, they're doing a lot of cashback. But at some point, if it, you need to figure out whether your cashback is leading you to more revenue. But they in sort of gave a beautiful example, right? For them to acquire a customer takes in more uh, dollar value as compared to giving out this. So it, if the value is derived, it is okay. So it, it's, it depends on your company, it's very personal. And that's why I said, for some companies, cashback would not make sense like ours. For us, I think uh, you know, new products, customer service, onboarding, all these are levers that we would like to use and not maybe a reference program. Some of the success metrics that we use, I mean, bread and butter, I think uh, customer lifetime, value, LTV, you know, ROI of your features and stuff like that, which help you evaluate whether it really makes sense to uh, develop a product. We are very um, data centric about it. Uh, Make sure that everybody is aligned as to what is the cost of developing a product. How do you, uh, whether it, the revenue is really uh, no, is notional or is it really something that is going to come up? Uh, what not to do? Uh, yeah, again, spend spend a lot of dollars on cashbacks and the wrong incentive programs and stuff like that. And over engage. Over engage was pretty much. Uh, I mean, I spoke about the notifications. I mean, if you do a lot of uh, notifications, it won't be counterintuitive. Um, so that's I think what I really wanted to speak about. Customer is the hero of your story. You need to treat him like one, whether it is offline or online. Uh, so yeah, that's what I really wanted to talk about. Any questions? Let me ask you. What is your? <laughs> no, you don't go up. No, this is a very interesting space, especially with you know you say Chinese that like Paytm. So what is the running? How are you competing with them besides this? Yeah. Any other you know? How you will, and they have a lot of cash, and now even with PayPal coming to India. Yeah, so I mean, so I work in PayPal as well as a card guy, I work in PayPal. Uh, so, Paytm and us, so we have both different lines of business. Paytm is more customer uh, centric, whereas the only aspect where we are focusing to the customer is around uh, credit. For us, credit is a big market. Uh, so, we have different products, we have Lazy Pay, we have a pay monitor which is being launched, and then at a national level, we have a couple of investments in a couple of other credit startups. Uh, so that's how we are hedging our risk. But fundamentally, if you talk, talk about payment gateway as a platform, I think uh, I I don't think Paytm is a competition for us. Uh, PayPal, yes. So PayPal, uh, the problem right now at least they are not really targeting India. The, yeah. India, they are looking at so they do cross border. So cross border is one of the biggest things. But uh, fundamentally, uh, one reason why I moved out of PayPal long back was also because PayPal never, I mean never believed in India. Yeah. Yeah, that was before we moved. Now yeah. they are focusing on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, more competition better for us, right? Validates our theories. So obviously, we are strengthening our mode to figure out uh, whether credit makes sense, uh, whether uh, you know other services around value-added service makes sense. But that that's going to be. I mean, if PayPal wants to come. Stripe, Stripe is, I think, would be a bigger, bigger threat for us because they are much more tech savvy. I think the more the competition, at least validate that your theory is right. I mean, you want to you want to make sure that obviously, as product guys, we want to be on our toes, right? To make sure more the competition, the better for us because it helps us uh, innovate and it gives us the freedom to make take bigger risks uh, rather than spend more time on marketing. So, in this in this day and age of Uber and Lyft and all these things, right? I guess personalized experience helps, and it's a broad question, but Specifically for you, you can take example of pay you for example. What do you guys do for personalized experiences? Uh, so personalization for us is around uh, so in different segments, right? If you talk about an enterprise client, uh, we obviously go out of the way to make sure, for example, Flipkart. I mean, most of Flipkart's traffic 
would go through our platform, uh, be it any big sale that goes on, because of the kind of return. Now, tech platform is really, uh, uh, you know, a very, very strong, uh, I mean, what do you call it, strength for us. Uh, because of the ability to, I mean, because when you, if you, if you remember sometime back, I think about two years back, Flipkart site went down after the, the first big sale went. So that was pre payu again. Uh, I think they were running their own PD at that point of time, they were working directly with banks. Uh, so payu, I mean, working directly for with the merchant and making sure that we have hold their backs in terms of either the redundancy for our platform or making sure that uh, we have obviously built, made sure that we have direct integration with banks and stuff like that so that uh, the merchant doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, so that is on the enterprise side. For uh, personalization on a on an SMB scale, it is I would I mean, be honest, we're just starting on the journey. But uh, credit and all these services, value-added services that we would want to provide, are ways to actually uh, get more pers I mean, give more personalized offers because of the kind of data that we have. Uh, so that's how we are thinking. Uh, how do you? Yes, I think how many questions can I take? Uh, the three of them. Okay. So, how would UPI affect your customers? Yeah, so UPI, UPI is a phenomenal thing that has happened over the last one year. Right? I think what we are working, we are uh, definitely uh, working on UPI platform as well. UPI 2.0 is going to be a game changer, is what we believe. It opens up new use cases. Every company is trying to think of what kind of uh, use cases that is, uh, that is aligned to their strategy. Uh, right? UPI 2.0 is going to open up recurring payments if you are you, aware. Um, it it could mean either uh, you know frequent payments, regular uh, I mean uh, I mean spent with uh, regular time periods, whereas the time period could be variable versus variable amounts. It opens up a drastic number of use cases. So we are I mean obviously we think it's a game changer. We are hedging our risk on UPI. Uh, I had a question earlier about safety, but uh, I Uh, the whole part is to get more inexperienced connected to financial inclusion. Right? So that being said, what's the kind of rough inflate of percentage you see in financial the PU side having tricks in the tier two or you know India section? Um so fundamentally uh, you know we, we go with merchants, right? I mean the I mean we, we tag along with them. If an Amazon and a flip card or any of these airlines, uh, I mean, if you see the transaction coming from tier two cities, we process it. So we don't necessarily go out of a way to target them because I mean, the merchants do that job for us. But if you, I mean, to, if, you, if you ask me, the split is about, I think it would be about 70, 30, or 65, 35. 65 metros or? Metros. It's still up both urban philosophy and basic the name is very cool, so it's, does it come across uh, as a very serious platform for merchants of B2B? The name PayU, which it sounds like Paytm, so Paytm probably is much more uh, B2C, PayU, people might just put you guys in the bucket of Paytm. Yeah. It depends on who your target segment is, right? For us, the target segment is a merchant, not a consumer, not an end consumer. Yeah. Right? For, and they would know uh, that Paytm is a wallet and PayU is a payment gateway. So it really depends on how you, what kind of language you speak to them. We, I mean, we, we honestly don't want to target the end consumer except for credit. And the channel that we have, and we are in a good stage, in fact, and we are in a very strong stage to, uh, for the credit market in India because the, the most important thing for credit is the distribution channel. And we have a very strong distribution channel because uh, of our platform, which works with various merchants, which has a lot of data, and we basically know uh, what kind of you know what kind of data comes in for every month. Right? Yeah. How much transaction flip card makes or Mitra makes or Jamong, we know everything. Yeah, why would citrus pay you know? This is the logic to why would you buy citrus pay? Why would you invest on citrus pay and then close your pay money which it was so much very good? Um I mean very strategic, but to give you a very simple answer, um, post acquisition of citrus pay, uh, our volumes have grown for four x in the last one and a half years, and we have we have become one of the largest players in the country. Whereas earlier, the you know earlier there's always a tip between us. You know, citrus goes to the same merchant, a pay you would go to the same merchant, and our bidders. But now we we are able to bring down our we increase our margins because now we are one of the biggest players. Uh, 
as compared to builders which works mainly with the education and the e-commerce sector, we are we work with the most of the e-commerce sector. Since you have Forex, is Forex increase because of what? We are able to raise our, I mean, uh, the volume as well because of because of the range we are able to provide. So in respect of credit, like uh, we pay you money, and you guys are in this one just funny as well. It's kind of competing with each other. It's like KTM has its own product and industry on phone thing. So how does that work? Because it's kind of conflict of interest, isn't it? Well, uh, I don't think honestly NASPERS work that way. It's about hedging their risk. I mean, they they put money on two horses and see which how it really works out, which which company is going to win, and then they try to consolidate. That's how they have done in most uh, most industries as well. So at the NASPERS level, I I mean honestly I can't really comment too much. Uh, in terms of like small scale entrepreneurs in India, like WhatsApp payments like going to be rolled out soon. So, yeah. how do you guys want to tackle that situation? Like, suppose if I if someone makes home like cupcakes or someone make like home yeah. like things, like, they want they can easily stamp that through WhatsApp to their consumers. Yeah. So, don't you think like you might lose out a chunk of small scale entrepreneurs merchants from pay you? Like, any any plans to create a new product on that side? Uh, Honestly, I think uh, I can't give you more details about it, but WhatsApp will not be able to run it up. They'll have a part. Because they can't build their payment stack. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay, uh, for that session.